Hallelujah. I want to I wanna, uh, share this passage with you, and uh, I'm going to say revisit with a little bit of a different perspective. If you've been here any number of years, we've looked at this passage before, um, and I want to kind of revisit it just from a uh, see what God is saying and to hear what God is doing and uh, saying in our lives. So keep your Bibles open as I want to walk through this text that's in front of us so we can hear what God is saying. And let me, let me um, I want to read this big idea. I did not get a chance to put this idea on a slide, um, and I want you to hear what it's saying. So listen to this, and then we're going to talk through the text this morning. It says, when you decide to put your faith into action, keep your eyes on Jesus and don't allow life's circumstances to distract you. Does that make sense? Yeah, one more time. When you decide to put your faith into action, keep your eyes on Jesus and don't allow life's circumstances to distract you. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, don't get distracted by the wind. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Say, don't you get distracted by the wind. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, don't ever allow the wind to shake your faith in God. Amen. We can talk about that a little bit. Distractions comes, man, in, I don't know, in, in a lot of ways, a lot of forms, a lot of different format, different what you name it. Um, things in life have a tendency to distract us. Um, as a case in point and or illustration, if life is going along for you nice and happy, then all of a sudden... Uh, you get called into the office at work and find out you're going to be either laid off or terminated. All of a sudden, that creates some major distractions in life. Come on, say amen. It, 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 it creates some major turbulence, maybe major distractions. In, in your perspective, maybe you think the marriage is going well. Maybe you think the relationship is well. And then all of a sudden, you find out that it is not, and it creates distraction. Is anybody, anybody tracking with me? Or maybe we, you thought for a while that your health is well, health is good, health is going okay. Go to the doctor and find out you have a chronic illness, distractions. Are you with me? Or, or maybe you have a goal in life. I want to accomplish certain things. I want to be in a certain place. I want to do a certain thing. And then life don't end up going the way you thought it ought to go. It creates a major distraction in life. What I have learned, and I'm continuing to learn about distractions... It's for those of us who name the name of God is that what happens when distraction starts to happen is that it forces us to a place of inactivity because it challenges our faith in God. Come on. God, I thought you were going to do what you said you are going to do. God, who am I? God, where am I in your plan? Do I fit in? All that stuff. And, and if we don't manage our distractions well, here is what it does. It, it forces us to a place of inactivity where we just sit and we don't do anything and we lose all momentum, all progression, all that stuff because we become distracted and the distractions has gotten in our lives and it's messed us up. If, if, there's, one, if there's one person um, in the Bible that, that I don't know, um, finds himself being distracted a lot, and I'm using that word intentionally, I'm going to refer to him as Peter. Most of us know Peter. Um, vociferous Peter, he always has a word to say. He always has a thought. Come on, anybody know about Peter? He always has an answer. He always has a solution. He always, uh, he's a fixer. He has everything. And, and Peter, in, in this situation that's in front of us, founds, finds himself in a situation where he ended up being distracted by his circumstance and it caused him to take his eyes off of Jesus and ended up being sick. I mean, sinking in the water. I want to look at this passage that's in front of us to kind of study a little more about this particular narrative and to see how distractions can impact us and to teach us, if I can use this term, to keep our eyes on the prize, to keep our eyes on Jesus and not allow the distractions in life to allow us to shake our faith in God. So here's what you need to know about this passage. Prior to the text that's in front of us, Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 14 had just received word that his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by Herod the Tetrarch. 
And for those of you that know Bible history might know that story quite well. Herod found himself messing with his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and John the Baptist had released the word that that was ungodly. You ought not be doing those things. And so Herod was trying to fix this problem, so he ended up beheading John the Baptist, killing him prematurely. Word gets to Jesus of the death of his cousin, of course, being human and divine at the same time. That is heart throbbing. That is heart wrenching. So Jesus decides to retreat for a little while to heal from the pain of what he had just heard. But what you learn about Jesus, circumstance never allow him to distract his, uh, take his eyes off the reason why he's on the earth. So even in the midst of hearing that bad news, if you read chapter 14, he still continues by ministering to the multitude that came to hear him. He fed 5,000 people, and you know the story well, with two fish and five loaves of bread. And it was at the end of that time of ministry that he tells his 12 disciples, I need you to get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake so I can find some quiet time for me to retreat and reconnect with Jesus. So that's where the story picks up. And I want you to look with me at verse 22, and then we're going to walk to it and, and, and read it carefully and just kind of interact with it to hear what God is saying. And prayerfully, something would be said that would encourage you to be more of what God would have you to be. Verse 22 opens up by saying, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Um, repeat out of me. Say, he made the disciples get into the boat. And to go before him to the other side. Now notice how the text picks up. While he dismissed the crowds, verse 23 said, And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. And I like verse 24. But the boat by this time says was a long way from the land. And my translation says, it was beaten by the waves, for the wind was against it. Does anybody see turmoil, trouble, trial situation happening here, right? So there's five things I want to share, share with you as we kind of talk through this uh, this morning. And the first one I want you all to get is this. Storms in life, they are designed to test your faith in God. Okay, so I need you to make this person repeat out of me. Say, storms in my life are designed to test my faith in God. Now, don't make the mistake of, say, of saying or feeling that the storm is for the other person. Oh, come on, say amen. Uh, don't make a mistake in saying that the storm is, is for the neighbor or it's for the spouse or it's for the brother or for the sister. Storms are for you. Oh, come on, I need somebody to hear me this morning. So storms, uh, they're designed to test our faith. They're designed to test my faith. It's designed to, to kind of get me to the place where I need to go. So here's what I want you to look at the text as we looked into this. Jesus had told, he just previously told the disciples, get in the boat and go over to the other side. And you could, because he needed to retreat to recover to get to where he needs to go. Now, as I look at this text, the first thing I observe by way of 24 is that it says here, but the boat by this time was a long ways from the land. Now, don't miss that. And, and the reason I want to point that out parenthetically as we move through the text is that's important for you to know if the boat was still at shore or if the boat were close to the land, the storm wouldn't have been a problem. Oh, I need two people to walk with me this morning. Are you with? Yeah. If they were positioned where they could control the situation, if they were positioned in a place of safety, if they were positioned where they could do what needed to, to be done to fix the problem, the storm would not have been the problem. But the text says, the text pointedly says, but by this time the boat was a long ways from the land. Isn't it interesting that when we find ourselves in a place where we have no control, that the storms all of a sudden seem to come? Oh, come on, do I have any witnesses in here this morning? When, 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 but gentlemen, when you gave, when you find yourself in a place where you don't know what to do, where, where you can't reach out and grab, where you have no place to turn, when you find yourself a long ways from, 
Yeah, yeah. That's when the storm has a way of showing up and, 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 and messing with you and having an impact on your life. Now, here these disciples were. They had gotten in the boat, and time had elapsed. And we're going to look at time in a little bit. It had elapsed some. They found themselves out in the distance. And then my Bible says that this storm came, and and they were beaten about by the winds, and and the waves, it says, was against them. Now, here's what I need you to know. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus had previously, there's another parable of him being on the boat with them, and they were traveling across the lake. And in that rendition, it says a storm came. And this storm was so fierce, it was so bad that the boat, they they literally thought the boat itself was going to sink. What's interesting in that scenario, Jesus was on the boat. In this one, he is not. Okay? Now, the point I want you to get is that word beaten, it, it, it has major impact because the word beaten means that they were tormented. They were being persecuted. They were being tested. They were being tried. They were, they were forced to have to process with situations they hadn't processed before. And isn't it that what storm does in our life? Come on, it makes you think differently. It makes you uh, process differently. You feel as if you're going through it all by yourself. Most of us, when we find ourselves going through the storms, here's what we say, woe is me. Am I going to make it? Am I not going to make it? And that is when the time we get the most distracted is when we are going through the storm because that's when we want to give up. Come on, anybody in here, am I just talking to myself this morning? Anybody in here ever been through a storm? And you didn't know how you're going to make it. Come on, you, you didn't know whether the next day was going to be real or not. You didn't know whether he was going to survive. You didn't know what's going to happen with you tomorrow. Anybody ever been through a storm? They have a way of beating you. They have a way of tormenting you. But the thing I want you to get is that the storm is designed not to tear you apart, but to strengthen you and to test your faith in God. I don't know about you. But it's only when I find myself going through the storm that I start to question who God really is. When the boat is at the shore and I'm close by, I think God and I, we got it together. But it's when I don't have nothing to grab onto. When I don't, come on, come on, when I don't see how I'm going to make it, I'm in the midst of this thing away from the shore and the storm comes. That's the first time I start, I don't, maybe it's just me, but I start questioning God, where are you? Where are you? It is in the midst of the storm. Storms are designed, number one, not to put an end to your life, but to strengthen you and to test your faith in God. Come on, does that make sense? Let me move through this. Here's the second thing I want you all to know. Now, this is encouraging because when you're going through the storm, it's good to know that that Jesus will always show up. Oh, somebody should have said amen there. He will always show up to strengthen your faith. The reason I'm saying that, and I even remember if we're going to read the text, the reason I'm saying that is last I checked, Matthew 28 still says, Lo, I am with you. Come on, always, where? Yeah, even in the midst of the storm, I'm still with you. The problem is you might not see me, but I'm still with you through the storm. So let's read. Notice what it says here. Notice what it says. Verse 25 picks up and says, And in the fourth watch of the night, he, being Christ, came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. And then he said, it is I. Do not be what? Go back to verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, that that piece of information that Matthew presents us with is vital, and it's very, very important by way of encouragement for us, because here's what you need to know about the fourth watch of the night. The Romans divided the night or the evening into four watches, and it's from six in the evening to six in the morning. And what that meant is that from six in the afternoon to nine equated to one watch, 9 to 12 was another watch, 12 to 3 was another, and 3 to 6 in the morning made another watch. 
And here's what the author is trying to let you understand with this piece of information. Listen to this carefully. We have no idea what time it was when Jesus released them to go to the other side of the lake. Matter of fact, it could have been two in the afternoon. We, we don't know. It could have been four in the afternoon. We don't know. But what we do know, it was the fourth watch of the night by the time Jesus showed up. And the reason I want to point that out is because I'm led to believe if I read this text, the sun had already set, come on, and it was getting dark and they couldn't see their way. And, 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 and the author's trying to communicate, they had been going through that thing a very, very long time before Jesus showed up. Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear it. And the reason you don't want to hear this is because you want to hear the moment trouble starts, Jesus is going to show up. Come on. That the moment heartaches come, Jesus is, that's what you want to hear, that, that you want to hear trouble don't last always. But I stopped by just long enough to let you know sometimes Jesus is going to let you go through that thing. Sometimes he's going to let you hang out in there for a long time. Sometimes he's going to let you fight all by yourself. Sometimes he's going to let you have to battle the wind and battle the waves and persevere and through before he shows up. But the good news is it doesn't matter how long you've been in the fight. It's guaranteed that he will. He will show up. He will show up. Yeah, you see, and sometimes, sometimes he delays his coming. I'm reminded of the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11 when, when Mary and Martha said to him, Lord, our friend Lazarus is sick. And here's what Jesus said, cool, I'm going to chill for two more days before I come. And a lot of you have been praying for two days and for four days and for six days, and he's still chilling. He hadn't come yet because he said, if I show up too quick, you won't learn your lesson from, oh, I wish I had somebody. You won't learn your lesson that you ought to learn from the storm. So he chills for a little while. He won't interrupt his own prayer life because of your emergency. Oh, Lord, you don't like that. You don't like that. Because here's what the text says. He went to the mountain to pray, and he was praying, and they found themselves in a crisis, and their expectation was he stopped praying and come see about them. And sometimes he delays his coming so you can develop your own prayer life. Oh, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me this morning? And, and it, wasn't until, it wasn't until the fourth watch of the night that he comes walking on the water, and then he used this interesting phrase. He says, the disciples saw him. Let me read verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart. And then he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, this is, where, this is where English translation doesn't do justice to the original languages because the Greek phrase there is ego a me. And if you were to look into the Septuagint and study this going back to Exodus chapter 8 when the Israelites were in, in, in Egypt and Moses said to, Jesus, to God when he encountered him, who shall I say sent me? It's a transliteration of the same phrase, the I am that I am has sent you. So here's what Jesus is saying to them. The I am has showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe he hadn't been I am to you yet, but what I am that I am literally says, I can be whatever you need me to be at the time that you need me to be it. Come on, yeah. If it's a storm, I can be peace in the midst of the storm. Come on. If it's hunger, I can be bread to the hungry. If it's water, I mean thirsty, I can be water to the thirsty. If it's parental situation, I can be a mother or a father to those who don't have parents. Whatever you need me to be at the time that you need me to be it, I can be it. So the solution to your problem has just arrived. I am has showed up. Ego and me, the I am, he says, is here. Come on, are you hearing me? And, and I need y'all to know that because when he shows up, here's what he says. Take heart. I am here. So in the midst of the storm, people, when you're going through, even though it doesn't feel like it, rest assured that Jesus is there. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's good news to know that Jesus is here. Come on, tell the other neighbor, help you. I say, other neighbor, it is good news to know that Jesus is here. Now, 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 let me, let me walk through this because, because, because the objective of unwavering faith, here's the thing, is not to experience the miraculous. Okay, I need y'all to hear me this. I got to say this carefully. It is to, and I hate that I did that that way. I want to say it is to, forget get you, say connect you with Jesus. The objective of your unwavering faith is not to experience the miraculous. I like this better. It's to connect you with Jesus. And you can see why I'm saying that. Look with me at verse 28. So here's Peter. Peter! And Peter answered him, Lord, if the I am that I am is really out there, so if it is you, he says, command me to come to you. And then he says, on the water. And he being Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water to come to Jesus. Now, I don't like this. And I'm entitled to my opinion. And I want to tell you why I don't like this. Because notice what he says. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. And then the author has the prepositional phrase, on the water, and he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and the author says he walked on the water, and he came to Jesus. Now, let me tell you why I, I, don't, I don't like that. Because... Whenever we pray to God to deliver us from the storm and we start defining the method that God ought to answer our prayers, inevitably the method always seems to be the thing that gets us in, problem, in trouble. You're going to track it with me? Let, let, let me help you with this. If I'm Peter, Lord, if it's you, connect me with you, Period. How you do it is not my business. Just do it. You can't get what I'm saying? Because here's the deal. I'm in the storm. And I don't, matter, I don't care how you deliver me from the storm. Just deliver me. When I start defining the vehicle through which you are to deliver me, I am creating additional problems that can create more problems for myself in the midst of the storm, and that thing itself will become a distraction. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Let, let, me, let me just go here to help y'all out. Lord, females, brothers, y'all hang tight. I'm coming to you. I'm lonely. I need me a husband. But God, he got to look like this. He ought to have this kind of income. He ought not have no health problems. He ought to, come on now, he need to have a retirement account. Come on, don't, don't act like you hadn't done it now. You know, we're in the middle of the storm. Now, here, here's another, Lord, I need transportation so I can get to work. But, oh God, if thou willest only give me a Mercedes. Come on, talk to me this morning now. Don't act like you hadn't done it. Are you with me? God, you know I need to go visit my sister in Florida. But Jesus, I hadn't flown before, so I'm praying for a first-class ticket. And we wanted to find the method through which God will answer our prayers. And I'm trying to say to you, inevitably that thing becomes the problem that creates more crisis for us in the storm. The goal is to be connected and to allow Jesus to, to deliver us from the storm, not for us to create more problems for ourselves. Because that thing becomes a distraction. Don't raise your hands. Anybody in here distracted because of their marriage? Don't say amen. Don't say too loud your spouse is here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You, you get what I'm saying? God, I need this kind of job. And you get the job and the thing becomes a distraction. Come on, talk to me. God, I need this type of a house. And you get the thing and the thing becomes a distraction because we can't afford the mortgage payment. Come on. God, I need this kind of a thing. And then the thing becomes a distraction because we can't adequately handle the thing. The prepositional phrase, on the water, became the thing that created the problem for Peter when he should have simply said, Lord, connect me to you, and I don't care how you did it. Are you hearing me? I want you all to hear me because here's the thing. When you find yourself in the storms of life and you're praying for God to deliver you, just pray for deliverance. Don't, don't add that phrase to telling God how he ought to answer and what he ought to do. Come on, talk to me because here's what we do. We find ourselves in a bad relationship. God, I need you to get me out of this. So God, here's what I want you to do with him or here's what I want you to do with her. No, no, God, just fix it. Because God might restore the person. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah. And the reason we can't get things right is because God is trying to restore the person, but we have told God how he ought to respond, and so we're blinded by what he's doing. Is this making sense? On the water. Be careful of your prepositional phrases while you're praying to God. Y'all just say amen. Let me know y'all have it here. Are you hearing me? So, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Be careful, be careful. So here's what he says. He says, Lord, if it is you, and, and I want to read this, Lord, if it is you, he said, bid me to come to you. And then he says, on the water, and then notice what it says. And he said, come. So look at the phrase. So Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water Amen. to come to Jesus. There's another reason I don't like this. It's because of that phrase. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. So here's my fourth thing. And then I'm almost done. And then we're going to walk through this. I want you all to see this. This is very important. Focus it on the wind. It will always cause your faith in God to waver. Okay, look at this, verse 30. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, or beginning to sink. Let me just read the rest. So he cried out, Lord, save me. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, hear me say this. The wind didn't just start blowing because <laughs> Peter was out of the boat. The wind was already. The waves didn't start beating up against the boat because Peter got out of the boat. The waves were already beating. Are you, you attracted to me? I mean, matter of fact, if you were to read when we open up the text in verse, uh, it, I think it's the la verses 20, what is that, 24? It says, the boat was a long way from the shore, and I said it was beaten by the waves and the wind. It was against them. So these are situations that were already in place prior to Peter getting out of the boat. Are you with me? Um, very, very important for you not to miss this, okay? And then my verse, Bible says in verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. Now, here, here's what you need to know about when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. Um, and, and I want to say to you, Peter didn't sink because the wind was blowing and the waves were beating up against him. That was already happening because the text says that Jesus came to them walking on the water, meaning that the same wind was blowing and the same water was beating up against him. But notice with me, those things did not bother Jesus. Are you with me? So I need you to help me. I need to help you see what's, what's going on. Here's what the grammar in the text is trying to get us to communicate. Peter's in the boat, and the wind is blowing, and the waves are beating up the boat, and they're rocking, and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. 
Lord, is that you? Yeah, Pete, it's a brother. Hook us up. What's up? All right, Lord, if it's you, tell me, come. Okay, come. Okay. Now, if I'm Jesus, you don't have to. But if you want to, come. I'm saying this for a reason. Peter gets out, climbs out the boat. And then the text says he walks towards Jesus. All is well. Then verse 30 says, then he saw the wind. Is that what it says? And he was afraid. Now don't tell me how you see wind. <laughs> but, but I don't know that he so much saw the wind as he felt the effects Because here's the thing, it doesn't say he heard the wind because he was walking towards Jesus and the wind was blowing and he could hear it, but the text when he saw, which tells me that his clothes got wet and he didn't like his clothes getting wet. So he paid attention to what he didn't like. And more importantly, for him to look and pay attention to what he didn't like, he had to take his eyes off of. <laughs> he had to take his eyes off of Jesus to look at the thing, okay? Now, what the text says even more clearly that's kind of implied grammatically is he didn't just take a look and look back up. It says he kept on looking. Yeah, and, and the more his clothes got wet, the more he looked. And the more his clothes got wet, the more he looked. Are you with me? And as he kept looking at the thing that was distracting him, he found himself what? Yeah, y'all getting it, y'all getting it, you're getting it. It's self-implied. Because here's the thing, my problem in life is not that, 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 that I don't keep my eyes on Jesus. It's the moment something that I ask for or a situation that I find myself starts distracting me, I have to take my eyes off of Jesus to look at the thing, and the thing bothers me so much that I keep looking at it, and I forget to pick my eyes up and to put my eyes back on Jesus. And I bet that my problem and your problem is the same thing. The reason we find ourselves sinking that very thing that we prayed for is because it becomes a distraction and we take our eyes off Jesus because that thing is bothering us so much. Am I talking to myself? Come on, am I talking to myself? Am I talking to myself? Because here's the reason we stop worshiping. It's not that we're looking at Jesus. It's the distraction has us, come on, from keeping our eyes on him. The distraction has us at a place where it ought not keep us. And the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus, guess what happened? We start to sink. Now, here's the reason I want to bring this up and revisit this text. The Lord revealed to me that Peter didn't have to get out the boat. Don't mess my message up. Let me preach it. He didn't have to get out the boat. The instruction that the Lord revealed to him was never go on the other side and then at some place on the journey get out the boat and walk on water when I show up. If you read the onset of the text, it was get in the boat and go to the other side. I'm going to catch up with you. Are you with me? So what we have in verses 29 and 30 is Jesus catching up with them, but Peter in his impatience wanting to change the instruction along the way. Because this story would have been Probably even better because here's where Peter was in the safety of the boat. And here where Jesus was coming to meet them 
to get in the boat. Yeah, y'all kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but here's what we do. Because we see the miraculous, we want to change course and chase after the miraculous. I wish I had somebody in here. I wish. And that is the very thing that gets us in trouble every single time. It's not about the miraculous. Here's what I said. It's about being connected with Jesus. Because if Jesus so chose, he could have levitated Peter to come to him. But because, of, because Peter wanted to find how God ought to answer his prayer, how God ought to do certain things, when I'm saying to you, he should have stayed his behind in the boat, Jesus was going to connect with him anyway. But because of who he was, he wasn't patient enough for Jesus to meet him. He wanted to hurry up the solution and go be where Jesus was. Henry Blackaby puts it this way, when God seems silent, hang on to the last thing you heard him say. And if he says, get in the boat and go to the other side, don't come behind him and say, can I come out and meet you? He is the I am that I am, right? He can do whatever he wants, so he can say, come. And he can respond to your request however he wants. His instruction was, stay. You guys are tracking with me? Be careful when God is quiet that you feel the need to have to raise up a request because you wonder if, you have, if you're all by yourself. The fourth watch of the night is a long time. And if the storm seems like it's not being fixed right away, we have a tendency to want to interrupt the process. God, tell me what to do. I just told you stay in the boat. But I'm thinking stay in the boat. But the waves are high. Stay in the boat. Come on, are you hearing me? Well, can I get out? Okay, if you want to get out, get out. Is this making sense? Hang out where we heard God speak last because it's in that place we find the best deliverance that God has in store for us. It's in that place. Focus in on the wind because when you get out, your clothes going to get wet. Stuff's going to start happening. And if you're not strong enough to keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to get distracted. Does this make sense? So here's why I said the storms come to strengthen you. Next time this were to happen to Peter, you won't read anywhere of him getting out the boat. <laughs> Is this making sense? Let's, let's wrap this up. And so here's the thing I want you all to get. So you don't allow your faith, the wind to shake your faith. Call on Jesus for help to strengthen you. So notice what he says. I like this. I like this. And, and watch my point. Verse 30. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith. And little faith don't mean he didn't have, it, that's not a numerical thing, okay? Um, we've been talking about that for a while. Why did you doubt? Now look at verse 32, and then I'm going to stop. When they got in the boat, the wind what? <laughs> and those in the boat worship him. I'm done, but watch this. This is what we do. Jesus said, get in, stay in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side. Okay. And he see Jesus coming. Hey, can I get out? All right, cool. And he gets out and he starts to sing. And I find it interesting that even though he was walking towards Jesus, the wind still kept blowing and the waves still kept rumbling and everything still kept going the way it all. Come on. Are you with me? Because a lot of us feel that because you're with Jesus now that the problems ought to be fixed. It's only when we are in that place that Jesus commanded us to be in that the storm stops. Amen. Wasn't until Peter, you knucklehead, go and get in there. And Jesus did one of these numbers. That's what I would have done if I was Jesus. I wasn't climbing over nothing, you know. I got superpowers, amen. But it wasn't until he got in the boat where he commanded them to be that the storm stopped. That is striking. 
Because a lot of us are asking for deliverance from the places we are commanded to be. Ooh, Jesus. Invite Jesus to the place he commanded you to be and watch what will happen. The storms will cease. They freaked out. What kind of man is this? That's who he is. If he says to you, be here, go here, do that, minister, whatever he tells you to do, he is there with you. And even though everything around you might be going haywire, invite Jesus on board. Don't abort the command. It creates distractions. And the distractions will produce inactivity and it will frustrate us all and get us to those weird places. Does this make sense? Don't, don't allow, don't allow, don't allow. Don't get distracted by the wind and don't allow the wind to shake your faith. I want you all to hear me. Listen to what God is saying. So this is the importance of a prayer life. What's the last thing you heard God say? What's the last place God called you to be? What's the last thing God said for you to do? Because that's where his blessings are. And that's where he wants to work. Bow your heads with me this morning. I want to pray this morning. Holy Spirit, you're a wonderful God. Peter's a character, Lord. But we can't be hard on Peter because we too find ourselves like Peter wanting to hurry you up, wanting you to move, wanting you to do, wanting you to act. And we find ourselves in these precarious situations or circumstances. But we thank you for the lessons that are being taught in Scripture, God, that we can learn from them, that even though we find ourselves outside the boats of security, we learn today that we ought to keep our eyes on you. And don't get distracted by that. So this morning, Lord, I want to pray for the person who may be here that has been discouraged and have gotten distracted and have gotten to that place of inactivity and maybe even losing hope. I pray today that they would realize it begins with a relationship with you, God. Getting Jesus on board, getting Jesus on board and keeping him there and then obeying his voice. So, Lord, should there be one this morning, God, you draw them to a relationship with you. You draw them to that place of repentance. You draw them to that place of saying, I need you more. I know I have gotten distraction, God, distracted. I know I have, like Peter, gotten impatient in that place. So, Holy Spirit, God, move in this place, God. Move in this place. Move in this place, God. We give it to you. That you be God in our midst, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing, for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. This